After the British army left France through Dunkirk, Churchill thought that if they had bands of highly trained men, they could go and wreak havoc with the Germans. Thus the commandos were formed. The American Rangers became special forces by training with the British commandos. On D-Day, there were army commandos and Royal Marine commandos, 45, 46, 47 and 48. 47 Royal Marine Commando was given the task of attacking Port Lombessin. It was an important target for two reasons. One is that it was in the middle of the 11 mile gap between Gold and Omar beaches and it was to be used as a fuel terminal to transfer gasoline and diesel from ships to the overland pipeline, part of Pluto Minor. Lieutenant Colonel Phillips was to lead the attack. As the port was well defended towards the sea, it was decided to attack from inland. That meant landing on Gold Beach, then moving overland to attack the port. The plan was Phase 1 to land near Le Hamel at 9.35, march to Mont Cavalier near Pont Bessin, skirting around the coastal defences. The first rendezvous point was at La Rosière at 11 o'clock. Phase 2 carry on towards Mont Cavalier to arrive at 1300. Mont Cavalier at 72 metres altitude, which gave a firm base for the attack onto Port Lombessin. Phase 3, following air and sea bombardment, commandos would attack the eastern feature. Additional help from a US artillery battalion might arrive. Phase 4, capture the western feature. The 47 Royal Marine Commander was supposed to land here at Annel, WN37. This was supposed to be taken by the Hampshires already, who were landing at half past seven. This was two hours later, and it still wasn't secured. So Lieutenant Colonel Phillips, who led the commandos, decided they'd go further along the coast that way to find a secure part of the beach. But turning to go parallel to the coast, meant that the landing craft, which of course longer than they are wide, became bigger targets and some were hit and some were sunk by mines. So they landed further back there, uh, past WN 36, across the whole mile stretch of coast. This is all that's left of the WN 36. It was a lot weaker than WN 37. It was just this 15mm gun in a trough and a machine gun or two. Now this had been taken out by the Hampshires who landed in the wrong place and then the Hampshires were trying to take WN37 along the coast but didn't get it till the late afternoon. So the commandos landed along here, uh, not in a single point, along about a mile stretch of coast and Lieutenant Colonel Phillips couldn't find his men when he landed. He finally caught them up later as he moved inland. So the men were rallied by the second in command. Then they started moving inland. The troops had been rallied by Major Donnell and that took two hours because they, many of them lost their weapons. So they recovered weapons from other soldiers and Germans, and they headed in to Anel, passing the church here, and went down this road. They wanted to skirt around the German defences. Their orders were to avoid contact with the Germans, unless it wasn't possible. The road, Rue de la Cave in Anel, leads into this path, leading to the Carrefour at saint Combe. As they neared Carrefour, they saw three Germans approaching. One had a machine gun slung on his shoulder. The commando splayed out on the lane side. The Germans were walking along in a relaxed mood. Then the man with the machine gun suddenly sensed danger and went to unsling his weapon. He was shot and the others surrendered. 
The wounded German was obviously going to die. They couldn't do anything for him. They left him clutching a photo of his family and the two others became willing stretcher bearers. From this path they could have had a good view over Aramanche because they had other things on their mind. Those phoenixes weren't there of course. Lieutenant Colonel Phillips caught them up at the Carrefour. Now it was 1400 hours. They should have been at Montcavalier at 1300 hours and they weren't even halfway there. They had another six miles to go. So they had to move on. They used small lanes as much as possible. They wanted to avoid Germans but advanced rapidly. A short way further they saw a German officer on a horse. He changed course. He had seen the column. A shot rang out and he fell. The horse inspected the lifeless corpse and then ambled away. The medical officer's task was complicated because as well as tending the wounded he had to make sure he didn't lose sight of the column. The best way to deal with this was to find a house, preferably with no Germans in, and the French civilians would take them in willingly at great risk to themselves. The most serious encounter they faced was at La Rosière. The Devonshire Regiment was supposed to have taken La Rosière before the commandos arrived, but they weren't even here, so the commandos had to do it. Now, a Company attacks machine guns on the flanks, and X Company attacked the main body of Germans. The commander realised they had no time to lose, so they attacked frontally and soon overcame the resistance. Some Germans were on that ridge over there, and one of them was heard to call out, they're only Indians, run down there. Because they'd been confused by the blackened faces they had grease paint on. Uh, his colleagues didn't see any reason to attack these determined men anyway. So they stayed where they were. Having overcome the resistance of the Germans, Lieutenant Colonel Phillips had an officers meeting to decide on their further action. And then they went down that way to carry on towards Montcavalier. Between La Rosière and Montcavalier, they came across a regimental sergeant major, a German, of course, on a bike, coming down the road, and he gave himself up with no resistance. He was quite happy to be taken prisoner, except he was a bit peeved because he was going to Wiesteram, which is just behind Sword Beach, to see his uh, girlfriend in the brothel there. And then he was going to give himself up, but he didn't have that luxury. So that was the end of the war for him. This is Mont Cavalier, or point 67. Now as it was after 10 at night, it was too late to start the attack. So they put it off to the 7th. So from here they had a good view on the uh, eastern feature, which is the right of the town, and the western feature to the left. And then to the left of that tree, which is now the golf course, there was what they called the weapons pits, or WN58. The lane behind me, with the no entry sign, leads up to Hill 72, or Mont Cavalier. And this way is the Hamlet of Escure. Now while most men tried to get some sleep on Mont Cavalier, only managed to sleep about two hours. Some of the men were sent out on patrol and they came down this lane here and there was a bunker which had been turned into an aid station for the Germans. And so the British took over half of it and they shared the aid station with the Germans. Early in the morning of the 7th, the British commandos in this area were surprised to see a group of Germans coming here just strolling along. They took them prisoner and the Germans were surprised at any British soldiers in the area. They were going to the aid station to report sick. Well, they told the British that there was a headquarters in the Chateau of Maison, which is about a mile away on the road to Bayeux. During the morning of the 7th, arrangements were made for the cruiser HMS Emerald and two gun landing craft to fire on the defences while RAF typhoons would strafe. Guns of the 147th Regiment were laid down a smokescreen. 
Several civilians came to give information. Esquire was a dangerous place now. The son of the Deplanc farm had been shot in the head by a sniper. The owner of the cafe, Chez Charlotte, had been killed while trying to bring in two British wounded. The family Beau, who lived in Rue Michel Le Forestier, they stayed in their ground floor, hoping to be protected from the bombs and shells falling. Later, Didier Beau and a friend decided to go out and they went down towards the harbour wall. They were amazed to see the skyline full of ships. Didier shouted, they're coming, they're coming. On the way back, he saw the body of a neighbour dead in the street. They decided to go to a neighbour's house in Rue Travelsier, which was a neighbouring street. They spent the next night and the day there. The Longrois family had a good cellar, so they decided to stay put. Many people were leaving town by the Chemin de Douai, which is at the end of Rue du Nord, in the distance there. The Longrois family had been sheltering for an hour or two, and then Paul, a sailor, came in carrying the body of Madame Roussel. And Mr. Roussel was with him and his daughter. They couldn't bury the body, so it stayed there for three days covered in a sheet. A second aid station was set up in a sunken lane along here, not far from Port Besson. The raid station at Escure was thought to be a bit far from the action. Once the aid station was set up, the medical officer, he thought he'd go and reconnoitre towards Port Besson. He started advancing towards Port Besson now the weapons pits, which are over here, part of WN58, he thought they'd been cleaned out, but they hadn't. And then he realised the Germans could see him. And just then, X troop suddenly burst out the line of trees, shouting, hollering, with their bayonets fixed, and the Germans surrendered. In the meantime, troop A and B had passed down the road from Escure, passed the weapons pits without being seen, led by the gendarme, Henri Gouget. And they got to the church here before splitting up. Then Beach route carried on down the road towards the harbour and then to clear out the eastern feature. And H route went down Rue Nationale there to attack the western feature. Didier Bon and his family were still in the house on the corner of Rue Nationale, Rue Traversière. Then he realised the door wasn't locked, so they locked it. But just in time, because then some Germans came along. They stood in the junction for a few minutes, then started pounding on the door with the butts of their rifles. Luckily the door held, and the Germans gave up. So they went away. Half an hour later, they saw some khaki-clad commandos coming down Rue Nationale, and going down Rue Traversière, towards the western feature. The Longrois family were still in their shelter in house uh, between Rue du Nord and Rue Traversière. Then they saw the gendarme Gouget going past with the commandos. So the father went out. The gendarme Gouget asked him if there are any Bosch around. He said, well, there's plenty up the hill there. So the commandos went up Rue du Far. A few minutes later, he heard the sound of explosions and gunfire. And this is about where the perimeter fence was around the western feature. So a troop got up to here, used the only Bangalore they had to break through, and then they split into two groups. So Lieutenant Wilson went to the right, and Lieutenant Goldstein to the left. Now you can see from here that uh, the eastern feature over there, they've got a good view and line of fire directly over here, and uh, 
contrary to what they've been told, there were two flagships in the harbour. Now those uh, bits of the harbour with the red corrugation on, that wasn't there at the time. So one flagship was just this side of the central jetty. The other flagship was the other side where there's two people walking and they could fire at the commandos. The Lieutenant Wilson's group was attacking along this slope here. Now you can see the bunker at the top of the slope. So there were grenades coming down onto them from the bunker and the flagships were firing at them and even machine guns from the other side of the harbour. And so Captain Cousins ordered them to pull out. Lieutenant Goldstein's group was still advancing this way to the left and Goldstein threw a grenade at some bunkers which revealed his presence and then hail of machine gun fire came down on them. So that to pull out as well. Of 60 men, 29 were casualties, of which 12 had been killed. Corporal Amos had stopped to tend the wounded man when a German threw a grenade which stunned him. He was taken prisoner. The Germans were discussing whether to shoot him as per orders from Hitler concerning commandos. They didn't want to do this, but as Amos was covered in blood and tending to a wounded comrade, they came to the conclusion that he was a medic, so they didn't have to shoot him. Amos then had to pretend he knew what he was doing as he tended to wounded Germans. He finally went to sleep. At the Longoir house, two commandos knocked on the door. They both wounded and wanted water, which the Longoir took some time to understand. One asked Antoine to pull out bits of shrapnel from his stomach, as Antoine couldn't bring himself to do that. The commander did it himself. Then they heard a German patrol coming down the road and it stopped at the junction. But after a few minutes moved off. The commandos realised they had to leave. Everybody was in great danger due to their presence. Mr Longois led them out the back door. Half an hour later the German officer came in looking for the commandos. He left and went up the Douai path. He was later found dead not far from their house. During this time, Troop B had carried on down to the harbour. They took some prisoners and then a machine gun in the house opened up and a machine gun on the eastern feature. One Marine was killed and 11 others wounded. The Germans had swung open the bridge at the mouth of the harbour, thus blocking that crossing. The only way across was by going round the land end of the harbour. Captain Cousins is fighting mad and determined to finish the job. He found the zigzag path that the Germans used, so it's not mined. He goes up to the water tower and he's told the 25 men to wait for a signal. He fires a flare and just then a mortar hits him. Lieutenant Wilson and his group ran forward as planned and the Germans start surrendering. They use the surrendered Germans to go in front towards other bunkers to get the others to surrender. The western features still had to be overcome. They start going up Rue de Far and meet Corporal Amos coming down with prisoners. During the night of the 7th, the Germans had learned that the weapons pits by the road to Bayer had fallen and then that the eastern feature had fallen. Their officers disappeared. The remaining Germans woke Amos up and told him they were surrendering. He was about to lead them down the road, but they said, no, not that way, it's mined. They led him down another path to rejoin the road. The Americans coming from Omar Beach joined up with the British on the 8th. The British said, you're Americans? They replied, no, we're Texans. Just next to the water tower bunker, there's a memorial to Captain Cousins. I'd like to thank a friend and colleague, Alex Wilson, for help with the information and documentation for this video. If you've been paying attention, the name Wilson will ring a bell. Lieutenant Wilson of True Bay, under Captain Cousins, was involved in the attacks on both features. Alex is his son. 
On the western feature, on top of the bunker, is a memorial to the commandos. There's those that died on the beach at Anel, and those that died in the attack at Port Ambessa. Captain Cousins and the other Marines killed on D-Day and the attack on Port Besson are buried in the Bayeux Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> 